questions and team parties uh, meeting here. We're going to have uh, some speakers uh, come up in a few minutes and uh, talk to us about uh, their campaigns. Uh, if we could uh, all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We try to uh, pray prayers that um, from our former leaders or presidents. So we see what great mm -hmm. that they had and the uh, basics, fundamental truths that our nation was built on. So tonight I have a prayer from uh, Ronald Reagan. And his prayer is to preserve our blessed land we must look to God. It is time to realize that we need God more than he needs us. Let us, young and old, join together, as did the First Continental Congress, in the first step in the humble, heartfelt prayer. Let us do so for the love of God and his great goodness in search of his guidance and the grace of repentance in seeking his blessings, his peace, and the resting of his kind and holy hands on ourselves, our nation, our friends, in the defense of freedom, and all mankind, now and always. The time has come to turn to God and reassert our trust in Him for the healing of America. Our country is in need of and ready for a spiritual renewal. Today we utter no prayer more fervently than the ancient prayer for peace on earth. And this is from the Bible. He quotes, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And God bless you all. And especially tonight, we want to pray for all those that are running for office, especially uh, for Steve Lonigan, for the strength and courage to continue to stand for the principles that America has set as our foundation the, the principles from God. And we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jane. Uh, we have a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, things here. Uh, let's see. Um, we, have, uh, we have flyers here that uh, we have on the side of about a thousand flyers to, uh, to hand out. If people have uh, their churches, you could uh, take these and uh, it's all about standing up for pro life values. Uh, so you're on the side, take a stack and uh, take them to, uh, to your church. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows anyone from uh, Columbus Baptist or uh, uh, Faith uh, uh, Alliance here in Medford, uh, but uh, we'd like to uh, see if we can get uh, a stack to, uh, to both of those churches as well. Um, we have uh, t-shirts for sale over on the side, uh, $10, uh, West Jersey Tea Party shirts. We, uh, we have our painting that we're uh, taking voices for, uh, $1 for or $5 for one or $3 for $10. Uh, we've got the farm fair coming up in July, 15th through the 19th, if you're listening to that. Uh, so we're looking for volunteers uh, to uh, man the booth and, uh, and spread our, our, our word uh, out there at the farm fair. Last few years have been great reaching out to uh, a lot of young folks and, uh, and getting them to wake up to what our, our uh, government is doing today. Uh, we have uh, elections tonight uh, as well coming up. Uh, Connie's going to come up and uh, speak to us uh, about uh, some of the things going on in the uh, Steve Lonigan campaign.
Uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, we have a meet and greet with, uh, with Steve at the uh, Pine View Park in Leisure Town. If you're familiar with Leisure Town, the park is at the corner of Huntington and Dorchester. So we'll be there at 10 o'clock with we'll coffee and donuts for you, and uh, we'd love to have a good turnout. Uh, should I pass these out now? Or? Sure, anybody who wants one, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Andrew, I pass directions, time, day, coffee, sure. donuts. Anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Then the flyers that Keith referenced. We know that we all stand for pro-life values. This is a very important topic. We know that Steve is the only true candidate who is pro-life. His competitor says he's pro-life, but all he opposes is third-term abortions. Steve stands up for the rights of the unborn children, the pre-born. So we want for these flyers to make it into the hands of church-going people, because they're the people who are more likely going to be pro-life. Please come see me to grab a stack and pass out at your church. Thanks. A little heads up on the format tonight. Um, we're going to have uh, Steve Longin come up and uh, address us tonight, and then uh, we're going to take a little short break. And then uh, the candidates for uh, 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 Senate race will also come up, and we have elections we'll do after the break this month. So, uh, without much. Uh, um, and J2AF has an update oh. for us. Oh, fantastic. Can you want to come up, please? Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, just on the uh, Second Amendment front, there's a, a little bit of news. One part is that uh, on 12 May, the Assembly, and I'm sorry, the Senate voted to move forward the, uh, the bill for the magazine ban, which is essentially a gun ban. It, it bans a lot of rifles and things like that that we're not used to. So what they're doing is they're reducing the, the allowable magazine capacity to be tanked. It has been 15 for a long, long time. We were promised that that was going to be the end of magazine restrictions. We never got the 10. Uh, so the deal is right now, it's on, it went back to the assembly for concurrence. The assembly passed it quickly, and it's now headed toward, if not already, on Governor Christie's desk. So the thing is, what we need to do is have people that are tired of having their rights just infringed upon and whittled away, we need to have folks calling. I have Governor Christie's phone number if you'd like to take a note of it. The thing to do is put a call into his office. He's being deluged with phone calls, and that's a good thing. I'll give you the phone number. Of course, it's 609-292-6000. So if you're concerned with rights, whether they be Second Amendment rights or any of our rights that are being Taken away on a regular basis, give Governor Christie a call. Well, the bill number in particular is Assembly Bill A2006, and it was also in the Senate as Senate Bill 993. But if you if you get through to the governor's office, you tell him you want to oppose a bill, they'll know immediately. I've called them twice already. <laughs> so, there's no reason not to call multiple times. It takes you 20 seconds. So, what was thank the you. Number again? The phone number? Yeah. The phone number is 609 292 6000. I have also with me a record of who voted how, and it was pretty much strictly on party lines. We had one Democrat vote against the bill in the Senate, and that was Jeff Van Drew, who was in Cape May County. And he is a he's a pretty conservative guy for right that. So, thank you. Okay, uh, passing the hat. As you all know, we uh, live only on uh, donations, so whatever you can uh, contribute, would uh, appreciate. And uh, taking uh, also donations for the campaign uh, on the side over here as well. So, all right, well, I guess without much, uh, uh, bring up uh, Steve Lani. <laughs> You know, I, I, it's disturbing to think that the 
Marley 61 Boy Scout 22 caliber rifle that my dad got me when I was 12 years old is now illegal. Because that little, beautiful little uh, piece of equipment carried 16 22 caliber uh, shells in its tube and one in the, in, the, uh, in the chamber, making it now. So Boy Scouts of America turning your guns. Uh, you're a threat to the safety of this country. Meanwhile, along the border of Mexico, drug cartel lords are hanging uh, in effigy, suited dummies, dummies wearing suits with a bag over their head on the billboards to strike fear into the hearts of Americans. But the Boy Scouts need to put their guns away. We're not worried about, we're not worried about patrolling our borders, but whether or not we, the people, have the right to defend ourselves against people threatening us by coming onto our own land and hanging suited businessmen as refugees, a, 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 in order to scare us. Kind of disturbing. Pretty much symbolic to me of the course this nation has been taking for the last several years. Not only just Barack Obama, but even prior to that. You know, I had a debate today with my opponent um, on NJ TV, which you'll watch over the weekend, quite fascinating. Because my opponent has repeatedly said that I appear angry and caustic. Oh well, my wife would probably agree with that. <laughs> um, I am angry, and I said it today. I'm angry that the debt has hit $17 trillion from a bankrupt in the future of this country. I'm angry at a government that's taking away our constitutional rights. Only a liberal could be happy when these things are happening to our very government. Only a liberal could be happy and content when the government is taking away guns from Boy Scouts. And only a liberal could be happy as we watch our constitutional rights diminishing right under our very noses. And the election that's taking place in New Jersey is, in many ways, the culmination of what started on April 15, 2009. Let's think back to that day with the launch of the Tea Party movement. The first day we had this explosion of Tea Party gatherings across the country. And that day was a reaction to, well, to a number of things. But what really ignited the Tea Party movement was the TARP bailout. You remember this massive taxpayer-subsidized bailouts of major insurance companies and big banks like AIG, the biggest of them all, $138 billion of our money that went to bail out these big banks and these big insurance companies. They said they needed to bail out because without them, we couldn't possibly survive. I opposed the TARP bailout. I would have let these things crash and burn, and in their place, Americans would have built new ones. So we gathered all over the country in that day. I remember being up in Piscataway at the park. My, we organized a huge event there. Um, and I'm proud to say a lot of Tea Party groups spun off from that event, as many did. Um, and then we went into 2010, and we took Republican control of the Congress. Because of the Tea Party movement, we reinstilled some backbone into the Republican Party for the first time in a long time. And as I was running campaigns, including, by the way, one for Mr. John Runyon here in this district, and Bill Haney helped with that, and then you helped with that. We had phone banks, and we were going door to door, and we ran TV, and we ran radio, and I did five races across Pennsylvania, and we raised money, and we had these, these guys who'd show up at meetings full folks like us, and they would get up and they would say, we're going to return to the Constitution and we're going to repeal Obamacare. And everybody would cheer. It was the best applause line. I remember like yesterday. They all loved it. And, and in some of these guys, as I watched them from the side, I could see it, almost feel it, that they were just saying the words. And that came to be the case. Uh, John Runyon in this district has voted to fund Obamacare every step of the way and voted to raise the debt. So he violated his promise to you. Uh, Republican Congress violated their promise to us, the Tea Party. They want you to go away. We all know that. And there's a battle brewing right now within the Republican Party to put an end to this conservative movement. And I've seen this for decades. Those of us who believe in the Constitution of the United States, the rights and the responsibilities of the individual, <clears throat> we're the enemy of the establishment. The establishment wants to elect people who will go to Washington, D.C. and make deals. Well, you're home, working your businesses, taking care of your families. They will go to Washington, D.C. and they will cut deals that will make sure that those big tarp bailouts continue to take place when and where they ever think they should be implemented. It's only, it's purely, it's more than ironic. 
that five years later, after so much work on the ground, that you guys have done, we have all done, that I find myself running for Congress in a district where I defeated Cory Booker just six months ago, thanks to you, by a whopping 54.5% of the vote, despite being outspent by $12 million. Um, but what's really ironic is that my opponent comes out of the tarp bailout. Here we are five years later, and I have a congressional candidate put up by the Republican establishment who made his fortune out of AIG insurance and benefited directly from the TARP bailout of his little company, York Insurance. In 2008, a gentleman by the name of Anthony Galliotta, who masterminded as the executive of AIG the implementation of 100, over $100 billion of your tax dollars to bail out that big insurance giant, shifted over to York Insurance to work with my opponent, Tom McArthur. Why won't Tom MacArthur expose his tax returns, like I have done, not just this year, but last year, four years ago? Why won't Tom MacArthur file his out ethics disclosure report, which is required by law? I did. It shows your assets and everything you own. Nothing. No disclosure of his house ethics report required by law. No tax returns. Nothing. Because Tom MacArthur is hiding the fact that he made his money off of youth taxpayers, off of the AIG bailout, and off of an insurance company that made its living making sure people's claims weren't paid. Um, that's not good enough, folks. Right here in New Jersey seems to me ground zero of the battle between the conservative Tea Party movement and the liberal establishment that has helped to give us Obamacare, gave us the TARP bailout, has raised the debt ceiling, and is helping to bankrupt America. I think all hands should be on deck in this district to win this race. Not because I'm the candidate. I'm proud to be your candidate. And I'm proud that you have confidence that I will represent the values you stand for. But simply because we cannot allow the liberal established Republican Party to continue to capitulate, to compromise, and to sell us out. And that's what they're doing. <laughs> Our opponent in the Don Giordano radio show debate touted that he'd been endorsed by the Chamber of Commerce. Whoopee! <laughs> the Chamber of Commerce has one litmus test, folks. One standard by which you must answer yes to be endorsed by the Chamber of Commerce. Only one thing. Over the past five years, I have worked shoulder to shoulder against card check, against cap and trade, against Obamacare, against all the issues that the Chamber of Commerce says they stand up against. But they have one issue that means everything to them. And that's a question on the questionnaire that says, will you support comprehensive immigration reform package, i.e. Chuck Schumer's amnesty bill? Uh, I no. answered the question, no. A profound, loud no. My opponent answered it, yes. My opponent supports amnesty for illegal aliens, for the very same people who hung those dummies in effigy, effigy the same type of people who buried that lady in South Jersey in a shallow grave live, her. The very same people we allowed, we released 36,000 criminal illegal aliens out into the public last year and who are burning our welfare state. That's because that's what the liberal establishment Republican wants them to do. My opponent gets elected, he's going to go to Washington, D.C. to do just what he's told. And everything will stay the same, which means it gets worse. Let's talk about what we're going to do. Together in the last decade, you and I and many of us in the room have accomplished some pretty stunning things. Some of you may not remember back in 2002 when Jim McGreevy wanted to raise the gas tax 10 cents a gallon. I led the statewide effort to defeat that. In 2004, as a small town mayor, not knowing what I couldn't do, nobody told me that small town mayors couldn't stand up on important issues. So I didn't know any better. Had they told me, I would have done it anyway. But in 2004, the Columbia Maplewood High School in Essex County, New Jersey, banned Christmas cards. They banned Christmas carols at the December 4th Christmas concert. I thought this was shocking. In a nation where we're guaranteed freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and in our public school system, we would ban Christmas carols. They even banned instrumental Christmas music. So I decided that I would simply do a Christmas carol sing-along outside their pagan ritual on December 4th, and I announced this publicly. I announced that I would do this, and it got a massive amount of press. It put me on, sort of put me on the map nationally. I was on Hattie and Combs, Rush Lindor, uh, you name it. I was on 
I was doing radio talk show hosts in California, Texas, Alaska, Hawaii, day after day, as we built up towards the big night of the Christmas Carol sing-along because this school board had banned them. And you know, the night I went down to the Columbia Maplewood High School, it was a cold winter yes, night to, to join this sing-along, and I asked people to come. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if it would be a handful of people. I don't know if it was a bunch of liberals who were ready to hang me. But as I pulled around the corner with my friends, there was about four to 500 young people outside that high school, ready to sing Christmas cards, including Orthodox Jews and old walks of life, coming together to join in defending religious freedom. Inside, I think there must have been maybe 50 kids left of the pagan ritual, and I think they wanted to be there. We won that night in a big way because the school board reversed their decision, and the next April, the new school board was elected. Religious freedom in this country is under attack. And we need to make a bold, bold stand in defense of that, because this is the very core of our principles. You know, we say we're endowed by our Creator, that all men are created equal. I'm very pro-life. I think most of you are, if not all of you are. There was an early discussion in the very first renditions of that document, it was all men are born equal. But after thinking about it, they said, no, you're not just born equal. You're created equal from creation from the moment of creation, not the moment of birth. We seem to forget that. So I can't wait to go to Congress and have the opportunity not only to vote to repeal Roe versus Wade, but to stand up for the rights of the unborn. I ran the business and manufacturing business and retail business for 25 years. I was never sued, ever. And my opponent was sued some 40 times across the country in the three time he was in business, but that's neither here nor there. 2007, Governor John Corzine decides he wants to borrow $450 million for embryonic stem cell research. He also wanted to raise the sales tax to 8%. He said that was going to solve the state's woes. I led the effort to defeat that ballot question. No ballot question had been defeated in New Jersey in 30 years. According to the polls, that ballot question to borrow all this money and it was going to fund every cure mankind could ask for, right out of your rural state of New Jersey. Massachusetts had already put a billion into this, California two billion into this very speculative research. I said, no, this is not the job of our state government to get involved in speculative scientific research. And it's certainly on a moral level wrong to use human embryos to do it. Right. So I built a statewide effort to defeat that ballot question. I raised a little bit of money. They have three million. They don't pay all the big special interests were behind it, and we shocked them on election night when we defeated that ballot question in the state of New Jersey. That defeat sent shock waves around the country. Not only did we defeat it, but other states realized they could stop it too. After New Jersey defeated that ballot question, they didn't try to do it again in another state because of what we did here. Since then. Both Massachusetts and California have lost their billions of dollars of investment in what they thought was going to be a cure to every illness facing them. this country. So we were right on the line. That's what you can do when we put our mind to it. A year later, Governor John Corzine came back and he had this great idea. He was going to sell our toll roads for $33 billion and he was going to use all that money in one lump sum to fund all kinds of Thing. So we can make New Jersey a utopia. Republicans were in on this. Established Republicans loved it. They'd get their piece of the pie. You know, those big juicy contracts and lots of cash sloshing around in the till. And I said, no, this is wrong because part of the deal, Corzine's deal was to sell our toll roads to some big Spanish conglomerate through Goldman Sachs and uh, would raise tolls by the year 2020 by 800%. It would cost you about $135 to get from here to New York City and back. By the time they were done, that's not a joke. So I launched the effort to stop it. And I went across this state to the governor's town hall meetings up in Essex, Passaic, Bergen. And every time I went to a meeting, more and more people came. And they had big fancy boards and painters and you know multimedia presentations and handouts and lots of state union guys there to support them in their SEIU jackets. and. And I kept coming with more and more and more people. By the time we got down to Ocean County, we had about 400 people at the meeting that would then march on John Corzine's <coughs> town meeting. He was not a happy camper. The following weekend, which was Martin Luther King Day weekend, it was a Saturday. His meeting was at Cape May County. It was at middle school. I went there, and I asked other people to join me, just like I had been doing. By the time I got there, they were geared up for us. They had riot buses. 
They had armed police with flak jackets. They had guard dogs galore. They were treating we the people like we were the enemies. They don't have that much security along the Mexican border <laughs> as they had at the Cape May Middle School. Well, folks, I was standing out there in the parking lot on a curb wearing a suit, handing out my flyers with talking points of what to ask the governor, a whole bunch of people, much like you, right out in front of me, when I was approached by a police officer. And the police officer said, uh, Mayor Lonnie, you have to stop handing out those flyers. He was a state police officer. And I said, I'm sorry, this is public property. Um, paid for by tax dollars. I have my First Amendment rights. These flyers are not pornography. You know, I'm not going to stop. Everybody in front of me got quiet. I looked behind me, there was these phallics of police officers shoulder to shoulder, armed to the teeth. Um, I wasn't armed, by the way, even though I believe in the right to carry. Um, so, but in front of me, everybody got quiet. So the officer said, if you don't stop handing out those flyers, I'm going to have to have you arrested. I didn't have a lot of time to think, folks. This was not planned. So I thought for about five seconds, and he said, are you going to stop handing out those flyers? I said, nope. And he said, you're under arrest. So I put my hands behind my back and I was handcuffed for the first and only time in my life. And I was taken off to jail, um, where I was mugshot and fingerprinted and I was handcuffed to the holding cell wall for about an hour. While I hear my cell phone in the other room ringing off, ringing like crazy because my wife and my boss like, what the hell did you do? And uh, I was vindicated. I, the, the, the story that came out in the press immediately was, Lonigan was fighting. This is what the course, I press machine put out. He was belligerent, he was fighting, he was antagonistic. It was not the case, but I had no way to prove it. We didn't have iPhones back then, believe it or not. We weren't videotaping things, and they were getting away with this. And then I get a call from Mary Kazmark down in Atlanta County, and she says, Steve, I want you to know I was standing on the sidelines videotaping the whole thing with a big old VCR camera. And that VCR camera showed the truth. And we digitized that little episode. If you want to see it, Go to the website called YouTube and look, look up, you can do it now, Corzine Kills Freedom of Speech. Because it showed exactly what happened. Everything was peaceful, law abiding, and that turned the world upside down. I received official apologies from the school board, from the property, from the state police, from the county police, from the lady walking by. Everybody apologized, of course, except the government. But that was the end of the cult toll like scheme. Even left-wing blogs like Blue State said, how could they do this? Sometimes we all come together when it comes to those fundamental rights. But folks, the thing that I'll remember, and you will see it if you watch the YouTube, is not what happened to me. It's what happened to the people in front of me. Because without me being arrested and they saw this spectacle, you would like to think everybody would yell out and say, what are you doing? This is America. They got really quiet. And they looked down to the ground at each other, and they turned around and walked away as I was being taken out from the cuffs. The next couple of days, I was on the radio in Atlanta County talking about this issue when it was exposed, and these folks were calling and apologizing a couple of people crying that they had abandoned me. I didn't feel it was quite necessary to cry, but they did. Um, but what that demonstrated to me is something I'll never forget. That face of authoritarianism crushed that spirit of these good patriots, even if just momentarily. At times, they recovered. And it needs to remind us that something very thin piece of paper stands between us and our fundamental rights and doubt to us by our creator, and that's our Constitution. And that's all there is. That's all there is. There's nothing else. Just our Constitution, our ability to defend it. As your representative in Congress, I'm going to Washington, D.C., first and foremost, to defend the Constitution and defend your liberties. And in every decision that I make, on any issue whatsoever, the first question in my mind is, am I defending your liberty? We've forgotten that in Congress. The Republican establishment forgot it a long time ago. We're watching our liberties dissipate today under our very noses. So in the next 10 days, I ask you to get out there, knock on doors, make phone calls, help me raise money, I intend to go to Washington, D.C., and I know I'm only one voice out of 435, but I intend to run really loud and powerful voice for your constitutional rights. They don't want me there. You know that, and I know that. They don't want you in the Tea Party movement, the conservative movement, to decide what happens in Washington, D.C. We need to change that real fast. And we can do that right here in Burlington and Ocean County in the 3rd District on June 3rd. So thank you for having me. God bless you. Let's work hard.
issues that faces uh, Americans all across the country today is the power of the EPA. Um, one of the strategies that the EPA has followed is to shut down the last lead producing plant in the country um, as the federal government buys up bullets for various agencies including the Postal Service, the IRS, the EPA themselves and others. What can we do to change the stranglehold that EPA has on you, business? Well, you're seeing here a federal government that is, is, is just reaching every single direction and doing exactly everything that the founders understood we had a limited government. Um, this is not a mistake. This is, comes from a mentality of a core group of bureaucrats and administrators and people and politicians who believe the government needs to control everything. If they know better what's best for you and your family and your neighbor than you do. Um, and ultimately, dumbing down the American spirit, our education system, and our freedom. This is, should not become of a shock to us. Patrick Henry said, government's a necessary evil. We've allowed that government to continue to grow and grow and grow. And this is going to be the, necessary, the, the natural outcome. So what I propose, and, and the first bill I want to sponsor or co-sponsor, will be required that every regulatory body, such as the EPA, OSHA, IRS, that on a regular basis, and I'll negotiate this, whether it's six years or five years or seven years, that all their regulations sunset, that every single regulation is approved and, and determined which is effective and meaningful, which is the economy or our liberty, and then Congress has to vote, rule by rule by rule, what they support. Hey, could you comment on Common Core? <coughs> uh, yeah, Common Core needs to be repealed in its entirety. That's my comment. I mean, it's got to go. My wife is a teacher. My daughter is a teacher. This is an all-out intrusion into the education of our children. It's the moral life of teachers. And that's what again to dumb down and tell us how to educate our kids. I've heard school board members, and, and you know, the original intention of school boards when they were established years ago, especially in this state where education on a local level is so important, the school boards determine curriculum. School boards picked the textbooks. School board members back in the 60s, the 50s, the 40s would go home and read the textbooks before they, and they decided what would be implemented. If you go to these school board association meetings now, they tell school boards that their job is to just go along and get along with what the superintendent tells them. That's basically it. These school board members don't even look at the textbooks they're using any longer. They're told by bureaucrats on the federal level what to use. So we are slowly just giving up the education of our children. 
I think it's really disturbing, disturbing to us as a generation, a lot of that. Yeah, um, I am still learning about politics, uh, especially with regard to a uh, county committee and how the candidates are picked. And I just don't understand how it seems that just a small select group drives the whole group. Is there some way that we can get a secret ballot for these people in Burlington County? The reason you County? have a secret ballot primary is for that purpose. You know who started the county committee concept? You know where it came from? No. Does anybody know? The county committee was started by a guy named Abe Lincoln. When the Republican Party was launched, it was Abe Lincoln who designed the concept of having a man and a woman local to the neighbors in every single district, voting district, and of course his state of Illinois, whose idea was to know their voters, educate their voters, and get them to vote. This was Abe Lincoln of the Republican Party's model. And it was designed to be a grassroots movement in which we engage with our voters. It has morphed over the last 150 years into a machine which is controlled by party bosses, in which these county committee people are often not even given in many counties the right to vote. Or if so, they're handpicked and negotiated by the county chairman. It's not the way it's supposed to be. As that system corrupted rather quickly in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and these conventions uh, were just party boss picked candidates for Republican and Democrat office holders, 100 years ago, the New Jersey State Legislature passed a law that calls for a secret ballot primary so that the voters at the end of the day would make the ultimate decision. That's why we have a secret ballot. It was actually a reaction to the corruption of these establishment party, both Republican and Democrat machines. Um, they're still there. They do have what's called the party line. Um, and they basically put a lot of value on that party line. I don't. Um, the party line is only as good as the people that have to vote. We have the grassroots. We have the message. I'm a conservative. My opponent's the liberal establishment party boss candidate. I think I know what Americans want. They don't want more of the same. So that's how that works. And by the way, I would still urge every one of you to run for county committee in your own town to infiltrate the <coughs> One more question. One more. Okay. Yep. I was just wondering what you thought your relationship with John uh, Bayer was going to be when you get down to one. <laughs> <laughs> to be seen. <laughs> Folks, I, He's going to turn white. I just want to ask you guys, because there is only 10 days left, and every vote is going to count. So it's going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's going to be a matter of who turns out their votes, who turns out their bases. It's going to be a matter of who's energized. I think I know who's energized. I don't know how the liberal, moderate establishment can be uh, really energized about big government. Maybe they can. Um, so I'd like to ask you in your efforts that I, a lot of you good folks have been with me a lot of times. We need to pull new people in the next 10 days. Folks that don't know, don't have questions like the, the event tomorrow. Undecided voters, we need to reach out to them every day through phone calls, through door to door, through getting people out to meet them. That's how we're going to win, the old fashioned way. So thank you for having me. Let's go on to victory on June 3rd.
And you know that sounds really dramatic, but it's absolutely true when we see what's going on in Washington. So please come see me and volunteer for Saturday or Monday. Volunteer for all this week knocking doors. I have donation envelopes if you'd like to make a donation. We can just, oh, we have yard signs. Yard signs are in. Yay! <laughs> and the door to door knockers get t shirts. So we have really cool t shirts. Alex is wearing his. Alex, you want to stand up and do a little banner for your t shirt? Woohoo! The t shirts are in. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> yeah, I planned to have that too. He's one of our volunteers. So that's all I have to say. Oh, no. Can I talk about ballots now? Quickly? Okay. So we're required by our bylaws to have a paper ballot. Tonight we're holding our elections. We have one person on the ballot for president, Keith. One person on the ballot for treasurer, Dennis. Do I have a motion to dispense with paper ballots and do a hand raise only? I make a motion. I second. Oh, good. Okay. So, so moved. So, all in favor of Keith for president, respond with aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Nay. <laughs> <laughs>
And after the war was over, uh, Murray's father brought them all over to the United States. And Murray took his oath of citizenship on the Constitution in 1959. And since then, <coughs> he's been fighting to protect and defend the Constitution. Uh, during the 60s and 70s, he was studying economics, and he saw the birth of the welfare state. And back then, he said, this is a horrible idea. It's going to bankrupt our nation. If you look right now, the unfunded liabilities of Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, it's over $100 trillion, and it's keep on going up. Murray's running because of the country that he came to in the 1950s that had so much freedom and liberty isn't the same country that we see today. The country that I was born in in 1989 isn't the same country today. There's less and less freedoms. And the U.S. Senate seat that's up in New Jersey is a critical seat because if we don't take control of the Senate, we can't get anything done. We can have all the seats in the House, but it's not going to mean anything if we don't have control of the U.S. Senate. And, and because of that, we have to pick someone who can deliver this message of liberty, who can say, you know what, this health care law, we don't want it. You know what? We don't want the NSA listening in to our conversations. Right. We don't want to have borders that are wide open and bringing in all these people and then get stuck paying for their health care, paying for their education. We have to have someone who's going to fight for us and to stand up for our liberties and deliver that message to the people of this state in a way that they can understand it and vote for a Republican to stop those things. And I believe Murray is that candidate. He has a vast handle of the issues in studying economics and the effects of all these regulations for the past 30 years. And because of that in-depth background, he can go up to Cory Booker and destroy him in a debate and make him look like a little rag doll. And that's what we need. We need someone to go up there and show the state, show the country, that Cory Booker is an empty suit. To show the country that he's just there for his own self and for his, for his own ego. He doesn't care about what happens to our state and what happens to our country. We need Murray, or someone like Murray, to go up there and say, hey, these are the issues. These are what your policies are doing to the low class, the middle class, and everyone in this country, and you're not helping them, you're hurting them. And with that knowledge, he also has the financial resources to take the fight to Cory Booker. So far, out of all the people who have stepped forward to run, Murray Saban has raised the most money out of them all. In fact, he raised more money than all of them put together. So we need someone who has that ability to raise the sufficient funds to put up a fight against Cory Booker. We need someone who can bring people from my generation together as volunteers and go out door to door to make the phone calls out of me. And, and that's why you know, I'm here and I'm coming and asking you for your support tonight. And you know, ch check out our website. And if you have any questions, you know, after uh, I'm done here and uh, the other candidates done, we'll be up here and we can answer all your questions for you. And on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Gas looking at $4, milk looking at $4, bread looking at $4, the regulations from the state, the rules we have to put up with, the craziness that is life in New Jersey. It's just too hard to live here. And so we look around at this frustration. The guy I'm running against, Cory Booker, he doesn't suffer from these problems. His parents have a lot of money, doesn't have any kids. 
and he can tweet himself a million dollars whenever he needs it. But I can make the case that he is just a, a failed mayor and an empty suit and ignorant on most of the issues, and he doesn't understand what is the needs, what are the requirements, and, and what people in New Jersey want to be able to do. He's a poor representative for us, poorly qualified to represent what we feel and what we need. And I could probably go around the state and find a lot of people that would agree with me on that. A lot of them I think are in this room, but that's, that's a whole other story. Um, but we're not going to win an election with that. Steve Monaghan did the best job I've ever seen of educating a population about the inferiority, the, in, the inequality, and the inexperience of a candidate. He did, it, he did it as a gentleman, he did it as a bulldog, he did it every way that had to be done. But yet, what didn't happen was we didn't close the deal and make the case for why full-throated, unapologetic, conservative Republican principles should be the playbook by which governments solve the problems being placed before them. That's what we need to do. We need to actually explain to the voters why someone should be elected as opposed to why somebody doesn't deserve the job they managed to snook their way into. So with that in mind, let me just please indulge me as I just step back for a second and introduce myself and try and make that case. Because um, I think it's important that you know me to understand like, why I'm running. And then I can explain this. Let me give you a little background, a couple little stories. Um, I was born in the Bronx, and uh, we moved here when I was like four. But when I was 10, my cat got caught in a leg hole trap in the marsh near my house. Was missing for three days as the Hackensack River came up and went down. Came up, went down. Fortunately, the vet was able to save the leg, and we finally found him. And my sisters and I, as young children, went and lobbied the town and insisted that these things be banned. They served no good public purpose. They endangered our pets. And you know something? As little kids, we stood up. We went forward. Not only did they get banned in New Milford, they were banned in all of Bergen County. As children, we saw something was wrong and we took action. Go forward a couple of years. Now I'm in middle school. And the space age is going by. I'm dating myself, right? But as the space age was going by, it was a very exciting time because things were changing and things were new. And, and we were doing. First it was Mercury, and then the Gemini went up, and the two Gemini were coming together, and then a pop, and it was just all sensational. I can tell you anything about the Saturn V rocket you want to know. <laughs> but my point is that it was going by so fast, and I had a sense at the time that when it passed by, we would have felt like we'd missed it. And it would have been important as a society to capture that and make an archive and a library somewhere. And I actually went to my middle school and said, this is important. All this stuff is going by so quickly, we need to archive it and have a special place. And, and I think you can go to New Milford today and find the archive of Space Age Memorabilia. It was started by a seventh grade kid in New Milford Middle School. Because it was important. We had to get that done. And then, as I was a kid, I was reading Boys Life magazine. And, and in the back of that, they had ads for schools. And I, one caught my eye called New York Military Academy. And I asked my parents if I could go there. Well. I don't know what it must be like to have your kids say, gee, I'd like to go to boarding school. And, you know, dad's a cop, mom's a clerk, and here we are. Uh, but I, I played trombone. I was able to get a scholarship off. I go to New York Military Academy. Two quick military academy stories. First one is, as a new guy, everybody tells you what to do because you don't know anything. And it's really not a very pleasant place as a new guy. But you make it through that, and your sophomore year, you're actually in charge of young children. The new guys, you have to teach them. And, and bring them along, get them up, get them to school, all that kind of stuff. So here I'm at my first inspection, proud, proud sophomore of my new guys all next to me, standing up. I had to drop and give my commander 20 push-ups. Some kid in my squad, his shoes weren't shined. And what my commander explained to me, and I remember these words to this day, Pizzullo, when you're responsible, you're accountable. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could bring that message that a 14-year-old could figure out down in Washington? The other story, the one that I really want to share, was that as seniors, we got together and we took pictures of the Corps of Cadets at parades. We taped our band playing music on cassettes, mailed them down to the Cherry Blossom Commission. And you know what? We were selected to march in the Cherry Blossom Parade. The entire Corps of Cadets was invited to come march in the Cherry Blossom Parade in Washington, D.C., just a couple hundred miles from Cornwall, New York. Now, now that I've been involved in running that school, I have to tell you, if something like that is not in the budget, <laughs> and the kids kind of spring that on you, they said what they had to say, no, sorry, we can't do that. She should have told us you were doing this. But it was such a long shot. Well, by now I was involved in, in journalism, and I'm the managing editor of the student newspaper. 
We start with the editorials. Opportunity of a lifetime. We start with the fundraisers. We get on the phone to the alumni. We get the parents involved. We get the community involved. We raise the money. The entire Corps of Cadets, we went down with the color guard and the band, and we muck it. We're, 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 we're marching to the Cherry Blossom Parade, and we made spectacular memories for hundreds of young people. It never would have happened if some people didn't stand up and take action when the time called for that action to be taken. Then I want a full scholarship to Cornell University. I'm at Cornell University at a fire drill. And I'm talking to another guy as we watch the fire trucks come by. He was an EMT. I was an EMT. So we're sharing our ambulance stories together. We're also sharing our amazement that there's no ambulances at Cornell University. If you want an ambulance at Cornell, you would have to call down the hill to a commercial organization called Bangs, and they would send an ambulance up the hill. We thought that's stupid because, I mean, there's, out of 20,000 kids, a lot of us were EMTs. So to fix this, we went to the student government, put a proposal together where if you buy us, give us money for the radios and the uh, first aid kits, we're going to go and be able to respond whenever the police need us on campus, so at least you'll have trained emergency medical technicians. First time that happened, a cop that had four kids get out of class and show up at a bike accident, he said it was like airborne arrival. It was just great. The other problem was that EMT was, was a three-year certification, then you had to go find the course again. It wasn't offered at Cornell. We had to go off to Tompkins County Community College to, to get those courses. Well, I came back after I graduated. Um, I graduated. I went in the U.S. Army Reserve. Uh, I served 20 years. I became a major in the Army Reserve. But anyway, I came back to Cornell after like 15 years. And this is my proudest accomplishment of my life. I came back after 15 years, and there's ambulance bays at Cornell University. They have a rescue squad. I'm getting goosebumps telling the story. They have a rescue squad. They've added EMT to the curriculum <coughs> because we got together when something had to be done, took action, and did it. And remember that school, that military school I told you about? Well, many years later, like, like three or four in real time, three or four years ago, you might have seen things that say taps for Trump's high school. Donald Trump went to the same high school I did. They had schools bankrupt. In fact, the board of trustees had decided to sell it. I'm not telling anybody. I went to the meeting where they described this and talked this over with some other alumni. I said, this is wrong. This is a 120-year-old institution that has sent leaders into business, leaders into the military, leaders into their communities. We can't let this close. In six and a half weeks, we raised $6 million, paid off the debt, we placed the board of trustees, brought in a team of thoroughbreds, and today New York Military Academy is still graduating young leaders who take off the military uniform when they graduate high school and still have inside the core of their body that sense of responsibility, accountability, attention to detail, and motivation that, that, that gets instilled in those young men and women. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that. But, but why do I tell you all those stories, and what does that have to do with the U.S. Senate race? There are some people that watch things happen, some people that make things happen, and some people that say, what happened? Okay? I don't study stuff, I do stuff. If something needs to be done, I find a way to get it done. That's what you need to be sending to Washington, D.C. And, and now in my business, I work with computers like I did in the Army. In the Army, I'd say, hi, I'm Major Pizzullo, show me what your computer assets are, and I'll help you accomplish your mission with what you have. You know, use what you have to do what you need. I do the same thing in my, in my computer business at home. Hi, I'm Rich Pizzullo. Show me what you're trying to do in your business. Show us your assets, and we'll see if you can get what you need done better with what you have. Another good thing to bring to government, right? This kind of idea. If we have it, let's try and use it properly and better. But I'm a change agent in there as well, because I get people to embrace technology and try and do things differently and solve their problems. Here's the problem that everybody's seeing now. Like, I work in the doctor's office with the lady who scans your insurance card behind the window. Well, she's terrified because of the HIPAA regulation that says if the UPS guy happens to see the screen, um, or like you're, you're at the dentist's office and you're, you want to book an appointment, you look around, try and look at the screen, and she gets all nervous. Yeah, there's federal laws about that. The doctor is worried because if he ignores his computer for 120 seconds to take care of you, there's a federal law on that. And the reporting and, and the regulations from HIPAA, high tech, the Affordable Care Act, they're crushing the, the doctor's offices. And then the doctor who has to run his practice is dealing with the fact that he has to put more people in his waiting room for these so-called uh, wellness visits, shrinking reimbursements, and he now has to pay for medical benefits for his staff. And, and those are no longer as inexpensive as they used to be, thanks to the affordable or unaffordable care act. <laughs> Not only the doctor's offices, I go work with builders. 
and then the builders, they're doing their work trying to bring money down from FEMA to rebuild the state after Sandy. And the number of resubmissions they have to do, and all the engineering is on their dime, because the government can't figure out how to get the bids approved, is, is grinding that process to a halt. And as I try and get all these businesses new equipment, they go to the bank to try and borrow money. And they're dealing with Dodd-Frank, where a community bank would take a chance on you, because they know you've been a depositor there for years. Well, they have to worry about a federal regulator looking over their shoulder and second-guessing the relationship between you and your bank that's existed for years. The federal regulation has arrived in everybody's life, and what's different this year, the reason we can beat Cory Booker is because it has come to the attention of the average citizen. Now, you guys have known about the federal government for, for years, right? The fact that they're all over and trying to fight them is trying to wrestle a squid in dark water. But what's happened is the people, everyday people that I work with every day, have discovered the federal government is there. Even the teachers. The teachers are sick and tired of Common Core. They don't like what they see. They have taken our children, and not only are they telling them what to teach, now they're telling them how to teach. They're take, treating our kids like widgets and turning teachers into factory workers and doctors into factory workers and all these people into factory workers. So how do we beat Cory Booker <clears throat> to do this, to get rid of this stuff? We've got to do three things in Washington. First thing is we have to get rid of programs like Obamacare. Rip it out. Common Core. Rip it out. They have to go. The second thing we have to do is defend the Constitution. And that solves the problems of the debt, the problems of the border, the problems of the overreach, the problems of them shrinking the, the military where it doesn't defend the country. If we just defend the Constitution, you shouldn't have to wait for the <coughs> Supreme Court to say something is not constitutional. I should be able to stand up as a legislator and say, excuse me, but the people of New Jersey cannot support legislation like this that, that is not in keeping with the Constitution from which we derive our lawful power. Wouldn't it be nice if the senator said that? That's what we're supposed to say. Okay, so we do all these things. And we do that not by fighting, but by uniting the Republican majority that we're going to have down in Washington. We're going to have a Republican majority. We're going to send somebody from New Jersey as a Republican. And I don't know who he is, but I think his initials are uh, Rich Pizzullo. With luck. Okay? So in my last minute, let me describe to you how we're going to beat Cory Booker. Because the Tea Party is a big part of this, really. You realize I'm the only guy who stood up at a Republican convention and said, by including the Tea Party and the people that are dedicated to preserving the Constitution and our freedoms, and the regular Republicans and every freedom-loving American, we'll be able to get this job done. Rounding rows of applause, and that's the one where I got the highest margin. I won that convention with 60% of the vote. Because I explained to people that by uniting together, that's how we got it done. And one thought about Cory Booker. He's 10 feet tall, 10 feet wide. He's the unstoppable man. That's what they told us about the Russians when we were fighting the Cold War. You know what Reagan said? Here's the deal. We win, they lose. <laughs> Let's talk about Mr. Superman. As Steve described, last year he had a 5 to 1 spending advantage against, against Lonigan. Incredible. He was out there with, with his Twitter army. He, he has support from all over. He's the rising star of the Democrat Party. The country was shut down by those evil Republicans, and every media outlet from Sea to Shining Sea was grinding our reputation and our brand into the dirt. And Mr. Superstar, Mr. I Got Twitter, Mr. I Got All the Money, Mr. Rising Star, he achieved a whopping 12-point margin. Uh, let's think about that. This year, it's a bad year to be a Democrat. Now he's out there defending every failed liberal idea that Obama wants to cram down the throats of the people of the country. He's wrong on the issues. He has to face somebody like Rich Pizzullo, who doesn't need a lobbyist to explain what is being done to the people of this country and has the backing of the people of this state who understand they're tired of what's going on. They would like to see a change. Because the Democrats are the party of government, the Republicans are the party of business, and they would like more business, not more government. So, Booker is entirely beatable if we just choose to do it. What, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And this is the year, if you're going to achieve victory, you have to seek it, and we say we will be victorious. The Republicans, the freedom-loving individuals, the people who want rules to be followed at the local level to solve the problems, at the county level to solve the problems, at the state level to solve the problems, and the federal government, full-throated, unapologetic, conservative, responsible, Republican thinking is the playbook by which the people will want to have business problems solved, and that's what we're going to do for them. And we're going to do it this year, because we are running out of time. People are losing interest. 
and starting to be more like sheeple instead of people. So this is the year we get out there. It's imperative we do because we did not inherit this country from our parents. We're borrowing it from our children. And we owe it to them to give it back to them better than we found it. My name is Rich Pizzullo. I'm asking for you to please join with the folks in Monmouth County who have given me their endorsement, Union County who have given me their line, Camden County who's given me their line, Burlington I'm on the line as well. You'll find my name out there, our signs are out there, our campaign headquarters is open, we're, we're distributing flyers, we're deliver delivering uh, bumper stickers, all the campaign materials, we're going up on the radio next week. This campaign has serious momentum and this is the year that we bring the message to the Republican Party that we are going to unite and fight, and that is how you win. Thank you very much. I'll start with, uh, I guess, the first question. Uh, Let me just stand at his right. <laughs> <laughs> start with the first question. I think we have a, if either one of you candidates win the, the primary, um, three, three candidates, um, what's their strategy uh, to, to go against Booker and, in terms of uh, campaign uh, momentum, campaign strategy, uh, grassroots? So Charles, I'll, I'll use the microphone. Um, <laughs> the strategy is very simple. What People, no matter if they're Republican, no matter if they're Democrat, no matter if they're independent, what do they care about? Let's look at the issues. We want to secure our country. We want to stop the innocent from listening into our phone calls. We want to make health care more affordable. And we want to get people working to have jobs and being productive in society. That's the message. Those are the issues that we're bringing out to the voters. And that's what we need to relay to them. We have a large group of youth volunteers, and we're going to continue to grow that, because people that are like my age and younger, on certain issues, like, we align, we see the NSA is bad, we realize that this healthcare thing isn't going to work out, we need something different than Obamacare, we need free enterprise. And it's relaying this message, and relaying it in a simple way, where we can understand it. And when you do that, you build momentum, you build a juggernaut. Cory Booker, you know, he can be out there and he can say and do all, all he wants. But when you have this momentum of people seeing the reality of the situation that we're in and realizing what the solution is, that's how you build momentum to win. And of course, you know, fundraising is a key, key part of that. Uh, we have a large group of donors uh, that are in state and outside of the state. And once the primary is come and gone, the floodgates of money will open up, and we're not going to have more money than, than Booker. Booker's still going to have more, but we'll have enough money to get our message out there and get people talking, get people discussing it, and then once those debate, debates start, it's game over for Cory Booker. Oh, sorry, Richard. Just uh, mm -hmm. you guys stay like two minutes to be good. For okay. Questions. Um, okay. A couple things. First of all, this is politics, not debate club. Cory Booker doesn't want to be lectured to. People don't want information delivered to them. The way we win this election is we get more of ours out there than he gets of his. And the way we do that is with good, solid, organized, grassroots recruiting, effective communication in every media possible, and using all resources. We reach out to every special interest group that has been promised the world by Obama. Do you realize everybody that Obama came out uh, supposedly to support and improve the, 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 the plight of Latinos, they're worse off. The plight of single women, they're worse off. Everybody is suffering more at the hand of Obama than he said that he was going to help. And as Paul Ryan said, the kids that voted for him, they're home in their childhood bedrooms looking at their fading Obama posters on the road. They're ready for a change as well. So we go out and we find ours and we bring them out and we're reaching them through Social media, that's how the young, young people are finding us, and we're, we're the leader in, in Facebook. If you come, please look at Facebook, because you'll actually see how we're interacting with the community in real time. Um, we're out there in the media, there's different news stories that are coming out. Uh, if, if you go, once again, just, just look for the different TV stations, um, you can actually learn about the candidates. And there's a call to get involved, there's a call to action everywhere. So 
those are the ways that we get people winning, is by organizing, getting out to the polls, capitalizing on our opportunities. And as I said, this won't get much, okay? But if you need night, you can fight. Questions? Okay, first, go ahead. Would uh, any of you support any legislation if elected uh, to uh, remove the Federal Reserve? Now, if so, how might the economy look since they're a major part of our economy if they were a major decided to do that? Federal Reserve was a mistake. Um, and, and if it served any good, it, its time has passed. It's turned into the tail that wags the dog. Um, it's, it's, it's inappropriate for any agency but the Treasury the, to be issuing money that the, uh, the, the states are supposed to be using, the people are supposed to be using. Your money used to say, this note is redeemable, this is redeemable for legal tender, right? No, it's redeemable for lawful money. Remember that? You know, it used to say that. Not the gold certificates, they said they were redeemable for gold or silver. But then they changed to say it was redeemable for lawful money. Now it doesn't even say that anymore. Does that mean it's not lawful money anymore? I, but yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, the issue of, first of all, reining in the Federal Reserve and, and taking away their, their mandate to manage the economy um, is the first step before you can actually eliminate it. It's a bad thing that needs to go away. You can't just fire it and transfer everything over to the, the Treasury Department because the, the earthquake, uh, the fiscal earthquake that would happen um, would be uh, tremendous. Before you could do that, you would have to reinforce the dollar's position as the reserve currency. Um, right now, that's only backed by the fact that you need a lot of dollars to buy oil. That's the real consumable. And the Saudis only take dollars. So as long as the Saudis are the biggest exporter of oil in the world, then we're kind of dependent on this very fluid dollar and, and it's very vulnerable. When we get to the point where the United States is the leading exporter of oil and, and fossil fuels in the world, then we don't have to worry about somebody else holding our currency hostage and we'll be able to manage our own currency issues. Uh, in, in, when Murray Saverin first came out, uh, he was endorsed by Ron Paul, and if you know Ron Paul, he wants to end the Fed. Uh, Murray has been studying economics for a very long time. He's a, he's a small business owner, and he wants to basically end the Fed. He had to do it in a responsible way. And first, we will audit it and see what's going on. Because each month, the Fed prints out of thin air $80 billion. And if that keeps going on, you know, this this dollar is not going to be worth anything. Because each month, they're printing $80 billion more. And Murray wants to rein in the Fed and eventually replace it with a more sensible uh, process of managing our currency. <coughs> Uh, I'd like to know where each of you stand on the topic of uh, uh, climate change. <laughs> well, it is a little hot in here, and it was cooler outside, so there, there is climate change. Um, I mean, we all know it's right. Turn the air off. Yeah. Uh, we know it's a joke. It, it's a tool by the left to basically get control our personal lives, say, hey, you have to buy this kind of light bulb because we think it's better for you. Hey, you know what, that toilet that you have, whoa, that's illegal. You have to buy this nice flow flush toilet. And, and like, yeah, it doesn't flush anyway. And then they went driving in Prius and so on and so on and so on. It has nothing to do with the environment. It's all about control. And that's the end of the score that you know. If someone wants to put a solar panel on their house, then let them spend their money and do it. Why are we giving them a tax break to put it on? Why, why are we getting involved with carbon credits and all this? It's all about control, and we have to have no part of, of it at all. The reason your toilet doesn't flush is you don't eat the diet they tell you to. <laughs> <laughs> It's not climate change, we call it the weather. Well, once again, when I was in this whole space age thing, they were also talking about the impending ice age. And then we were worried about that we were going to be losing, uh, gaining 10 degrees, and all the seas were going to rise. And then here's one for you, when the, when the, uh, when the ice caps melt, the seas are going to rise anywhere, all the time, right? Has anybody ever had a glass full of ice and put lemonade in and seen the ice melt? Does it ever overflow? 
Nope. No! no. Never. That's basic science that you used to learn before Common Core. Nice. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. So, right, but, but what's happening is because it's sexy and because you can get somebody like Al Gore who's able to get himself an Emmy, a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, and, and, you know, uh, a, a Trix decoder ring, every prize you can imagine, by perpetrating a falsehood that did little more than line his pockets in one of the worst crimes I've ever seen perpetrated on a large population. Um, my attitude on, on climate change is, yes it is, and the reason we are people is that we have determined ways to make sure that our species survives and our economies survive as climates change. What really happens is, when we try and take areas that are um, totally destroyed because the climate has changed, it's gotten too dry, and it's no longer practical to pump water in, well, maybe migration happens. This is the wrong place to live. That, that's something that we should allow people to consider. But when we tie people to an area, then they don't get to do it. And that's happening now with the labor market, too. If you keep people on unemployment in an area where there are no jobs, you're not going to get more jobs. At some point, they have to say, like my great-grandfather did, there's nothing going on here. We need to go move to where there is growth and opportunity. And when you, when you give people a food <coughs> pellet every week to keep them around so that they can vote reliably for you, you're not serving them, you're using them and abusing them. Yeah, I'd like to ask the question of both of you. The IRS is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, agency in this country. Uh, many people don't realize they can walk up, knock on your door, you didn't pay your taxes, sir, get out, stand over there, uh, we're taking everything out of your house and you're eliminated as an individual with your uh, personal products that you have in your home, and your home. Uh, what would you do, both candidates, to either get a flat tax, try to do the IRS to a point where it's not so invasive in all our lives, and then second, the Veterans Administration is a mess. What would you do to help all us veterans, probably many of them here, to, uh, to skirt and get through the system? Okay, first of all, I wore the uniform of the country. And I think it's abominable what we're doing to our veterans because the only true entitlements that really exist, the only entitlements that exist in this country are the ones earned by the people who put on the uniform and wrote a check payable to the full amount of their life, redeemable at the beck and call of the President of the United States. And as we go forward into Memorial Day, and we, and we remember those, who gave the last full measure of devotion for their country. We have to dedicate ourselves to taking care of the veterans and giving them the entitlements to which they're determined. Everything else is a gift. Everything else the government hands to people is charity. It's given of the good graces of people, politicians, who like to make themselves feel good with your money. But the true entitlements are the ones that have been earned by our veterans, and I believe that it's horrible that we're not we're not helping them to the greatest degree that the greatest civilization in the history of history could provide. That's abominable. That having been said, your question about the IRS is that, what, let me talk about the Declaration of Independence, because in there somewhere, there's a piece where he sent hither his officers to harass us. Yeah, they were very sensitive to the idea of, of the crown, of the monarch, of the central government having the ability to actually go out and harass a citizen. Founders didn't want that. They knew that that would be extraordinarily bad, and to empower a government with that would be the greatest mistake in the history of the republic that they tried to create and preserve. So, there was a reason why there was no direct income tax. There should never be a reason for the federal government, which was organized to defend the Union and allow the states to work together as sovereigns to, to achieve collective goals. There's no reason why there should be a direct income tax. There should be no reason why any of us writes a check and sends it to the federal government. A couple of things can be done. The federal government allows trade to happen in and out of our country constantly. And the first time anybody pays a tax for something that's been manufactured by a slave over in a foreign country with materials that were ripped out of the earth while polluting the environment, the first time anybody pays a tax is when one responsible American citizen sells it to another one. And that's a shame to let people play in our sandbox and we don't tax them at the borders. We can replace the revenue we're collecting from each other by charging people their fair share for
for the opportunity to play in the American Sandbox. Yeah. So whenever I ask the issue about taxes, Murray always points over to Cuba. And if you don't know, Cuba has a lower corporate tax rate than we do. Also, Vietnam has a lower corporate tax rate than we do. In fact, we're basically number one when it comes to corporate tax rate. So if we want to create jobs and weaken the power of the IRS, why don't we cut the corporate taxes so we're competitive with communist Cuba? And you know, going to what's happening in the VA, I mean, it's it's a spread. I mean, you have these brave men and women who sign up to give their lives. And when they get the actual paycheck, it's it's nothing compared to what those in Congress make. Those in Congress make more than what your average soldier makes. And that in and of itself is a disgrace. And then when they come back here, they're waiting in line for over a year, they're having their records burned and destroyed, and then some of them passed away because of it. I mean, that's almost what our health care will look like under Obamacare. And we have to save the VA from this, and we have to save ourselves from it as well. And you know, we have to stand up for those who gave their life for us, and Make them proud. One more question right here. So, you mentioned uh, working with Facebook a lot, and one of the things that I see every day, uh, the, the major argument, the major issue that I think has changed, particularly since the founding of this country to today, is our reliance on our faith and our ability to put our beliefs into government. Um, our founder, the founders really, uh, you know, they made the Constitution and they, and they said, basically, you know, if somebody doesn't follow their conscience, they, they can't, we can't have good government. Now, it's <coughs> that every argument that I have on, you know, through social media, it, it's flipped 180 degrees uh, to, uh, the fact that if you bring your own conscience in, you're therefore violating somebody else. How do you, how do you get the message through? Um, you know, put put America back on track, and to allow people, uh, allow our representatives faith and um, uh, faith and moral fiber to shine through in government instead of you know, have that be um, a brick wall that our representatives run up against. Um, you know, Murray looked basically to his father. I mean, because when they were growing up in Germany, they were persecuted for their faith. And what his family did is, you know what? Sure, you know what, come after us. You know what? I'm going to grab a group of 300 other people and we're going to fight you. We're going to go after you. When you invade other countries, we're going to be there and we're going to challenge you every step of the way. So Murray's father led a group of 300 people battling the Nazis uh, who persecuted their faith. And it's in that light where Murray has his strong defense of religion and also the Second Amendment. And, you know, when he goes down to Washington and he's standing there, He's not going to be intimidated by a few cameras or what people have to say. Because his family was intimidated by the bayonet of the Nazis. And it's that courage, that conviction, that you have to have when you go there to stand up for those things that you hold dear to your heart. Dear to your heart. And you know, when it comes to conveying that message to the others, the best answer is just to speak with your heart. To, to say what your convictions are. Because they can sit there and they can start screaming and being nasty, but when they do that, they expose themselves for who they are. And everyone else sees who you really are. You don't bring religion into government by describing your religion to people. Don't inspire people to faith by describing their faith. God is real. I believe
believe in God with every fiber of my being. Faith is a choice. Some people choose. Some people don't choose. Some people choose to follow their God in different ways. But the way to find someone who believes in their faith is to look for people who practice it and how they live. It's one thing to espouse Christian principles. It's another one to live by them. It's one thing to be able to read Leviticus and see if there's some good stuff in there that could actually help us when we're trying to figure out how we should care for our neighbors. There's also some good lessons to be learned through all the other religions. I was a religious broadcaster in college. I hosted Words and Music from Sage Chapel on the campus of Cornell University. And every week we had a leader from a different religion in, and we talked to them. And there's a common thread among all people of faith. And basically they would like to live in peace with their neighbors and have rules by which their children understand that there is a higher authority that even their all-powerful parents must account to. And if we live in that manner, then when you speak in Congress, when you speak with conviction, when you act with conviction, that's how you bring your faith in. And you should look for people who live their faith and live their values as opposed to just talking about them. And if you see them, follow them. Because they're not looking for people to follow them, but you find yourself naturally doing that. That's why you were called to faith, and that's why each of you probably worship in different congregations. But where you are, you're happy following your leaders. And that's how leaders inside Congress will come together, is to understand that we all have a common moral thread that we have to, that we have to abide by. Most importantly is that we don't steal from our children. We honor our mothers and fathers. We don't kill. There are things that you are supposed to protect, and you live by that, and that's how you judge. Thank you. One last question, Bill. Regardless of who wins the primary in June, whether it's you, Mr. Pizzullo, or you, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Saban's representative. Right, right. <laughs> um, will you throw your considerable value and weight behind the, uh, the winner of the um, uh, primary? No, because I have some severe issues with some of the candidates that are in the race. I invite you to look at them, and, and you make your own decision when you go to the ballot box. And your answer? Uh, my, I can't speak for Murray, but I would... Well, you're here speaking for Murray. That's right. There are some that not, it would not go so. Yeah, well, like let's suppose that it's, that it's uh, Murray Sabrin who wins. Would you yes. support him? Yes, I have. And let's suppose Murray that it's Mitch And I would like to hire wins. Murray. In fact, to work for me when I'm elected, this is really an open area. <laughs> Let's suppose that it's Mr. Pizzullo who wins. Would you, would Murray Sabrin support him? Yes. So Murray it's the, the unite the fight. Thank you. Just, just okay, one last question. One, one quick question. <coughs> where, where do the candidates stand on a woman's right to choose? Uh, we're both 100% elected. Period. Fair enough. Yeah. Back back. <laughs> I plan to have a face-to-face -face conversation with Mitch McConnell. I, my, my objective is to change his heart and to get him voting with people. To understand that conservatives aren't there being belligerent. Conservatives are there trying to, to use experience and, and use what has been proven to work as opposed to what feels good. That's, that's my conversation with Mitch. So my first conversation with him is going to be extremely cordial as I tr seek to understand his positions so that I can bring him closer to mine. First seek to understand, then to be understood. Because I have to change hearts. Yeah, exactly. You have to show your positions and hey, it's time to stop just talking about stuff and it's time to actually do stuff. And I think that's the first step you have to take forward with the Republican leadership. And as far as Harry Reid's concerned, my mother wouldn't like me saying those words. <laughs>
in prison, has been in there for five months with her son. We have the, the military sergeant that's over in Mexico that's been held. Um, what, how do we respond? Well, I mean, 15 the, months, this girl, she's going to be Tell me the isolationist tomorrow. says. Mr. Brigham forces them. <laughs> There, there, are, there are people being held all over the world. There's also Petra Assad over in Iran is being held for his face. Yeah. Um, back in ancient Rome, Roman peace was described because the Roman military was so strong, no one would dare touch a Roman citizen. Mary wants to have our military be so strong, so powerful, that no one would think of touching and harming an American citizen. And if actions require someone to be rescued from a foreign land, those actions have to be taken. Really? I got a YouTube video you have to watch. Oh, uh, okay. I get my I get my foreign policy. Does anybody have a dollar bill? I get my foreign policy for the back of the dollar bill. And I'll get to your specific question in a second. Back of the dollar bill, you have the Great Seal of the United States. Grace of the United States is an eagle, a very powerful bird. We're a very powerful country. He's looking off to the right, which is forward for the eagle. And in his right claw, he has an olive branch. Olive branch represents hope, represents opportunity. It represents growth and a future. I didn't make this up. It's biblical. What did the dove have in his beak when he flew back to the ark? An olive branch. That's why we chose that. And, and that's what the United States would like to have, is peace. We would like to have peace with our neighbors. We would like to have growth and opportunity. In his other claw, there's arrows. Because if peace and opportunity and friendship and hope don't work, we are prepared to go to war. Lawfully declared war by our Congress. But we are prepared with a military strong enough to do that. And the difference between being an isolationist, where you have a strong military in your home port, and being an American, where your aircraft carriers circle the world hours from trouble places. Because when an American aircraft carrier pulls 200 miles offshore of a country, it projects force a thousand miles inland. Think about that. Think about that. As a matter of fact, that's what Lyndon Johnson said during the Israeli war, when the Russians sent some aircraft carriers to help the Arabs. He sent twice as many aircraft carriers, and in Johnson's terms, words, I shoved those aircraft carriers right up his, and uh, that's what an American does. You have a force, like Ronald Reagan had, where you won the Cold War without firing a shot. Now, in your particular case, in the case of Mexico, taking our armed service members, it's the responsibility of the United States to do what we did in Nicaragua when the Nicaraguan leadership chose to disobey our laws. You don't, particularly a neighbor, they, they, they should not be <coughs> our people. They've been taunting us and they've been abusing us and they've run up against us before. We should not allow our military personnel to be used and abused by a foreign government. I can't speak to the issue in Boston, that, that's a, in Massachusetts, which is, which, is a, which is a horrible civil rights case. Um, and, and that's why there, there are such things as habeas corpus, at least, so that we don't have people totally disappear. I'm more concerned about the, the lack of outrage for the world where 200 schoolgirls can disappear. More, more young humans than were on an aircraft carrier or on an aircraft that disappeared when the whole world mobilized billions of dollars worth of resources and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of manpower and fuel searching for people most likely dead, trying to find the iron. And when human beings are known to be suffering and at risk of imminent death, the rest of the world just buries its head in the sand. And the United States, by not having the military will and the military disbursement, right now is so crippled that all we can do is leave from behind and whine and I'm disgusted. Or the moral fiber. All right, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, good luck in the campaign. Support our local campaigns, uh, folks that are running uh, locally, and uh, really do what we can. Ten days to go.
and, and we need all, all hands on that because uh, Steve said earlier. So thank you all for coming tonight. I, I got science, literature, anybody you want stuff, feel free to take it and I'll send more out if you want it. Because uh, time, for, time for thinking is over, time for working now. We've got to get something collected.